This is the Person of Interest podcast, where we meet extraordinary people with a story to tell. Well, welcome back to the podcast from a slightly chilly Riga this morning. I'm delighted to welcome another guest to the Stockholm School of Economics here. His name is Reynis Rubenis. Welcome, Reynis. Welcome. And I understand this is certainly not the first time you've come into this building. No, it hasn't. But it has been some time since I was last here. I think it has been, what is it, about 23 years? I'm third year student. Okay. Uh, so, and uh, well, I should mention that now you're the chief executive officer of Swedbank in Latvia, and you have been for the last three years. And I believe you've been actually with the bank for more than 12 years. Yes, you are very right. So, no one I can think of is a better place to give us a bit of an overview of not just the financial sector in Latvia, but maybe a comparison of uh, the Baltic and Scandinavian uh, financial sectors, banking systems, mm-hmm. how they how they are par- parallel, how they're all one thing. But we'll get onto that in a minute. I'd like yeah. to find out a little bit more about you first. Mm-hmm. So could you just trace your route into banking via education for me, please? Actually, I can. And you are very much right, since they are coming from here. I think uh, since I'm uh, a post-Soviet child, of course, uh, in our families, we were not... Um, so of uh, discussing in, in Soviet era very much about finance, etc. And I'm actually coming from philosopher's family, so financial aspects were uh, not discussed uh, almost at all in my family. So my first touch point with finance is actually from here, and my passion is partially coming from Peter Hockfeld. He was a financial markets uh, teacher here, second year. It was the toughest course, and people were really scared because there was quite a people who actually were failing the course. Many had to take it twice, but it was demanding. It was uh, mathematics-based. He was very charismatic, and I should say that I very much enjoyed it. But then why did you come here in the first place? If you came from this uh, philosophical family, why did you come to the SSE? Yeah, Yeah, it's... uh, it's, uh, it's mid-90s. Things were changing in Latvia. Uh, I should say that initially I was actually planning to study um, uh, documentary uh, uh, documentary film school. Mm-hmm. I was uh, my, my father's uh, best friend was uh, one of very well-known documentary uh, uh, film producers, uh, Juris Podneks, and he was always coming to our uh, Jani uh, at uh, midsummer and always uh, talking so passionately about his projects. And I was actually thinking that I will um, go into his steps. And uh, initially, I was actually planning to go to St. Petersburg to study in the film school. Mm. But then it was 90s, and my sister was a bit more pragmatic about uh, me, and she saw me a bit more leaning towards arts, etc., and she apparently thought that this is not going the right way. So I can uh, uh, admit that it is my sister who submitted the application for me to study at SSC. <laughs> so she, she wrote the essay why Rainis Rubinis wants to study in <laughs> SSC. So she knew what was good so for she you. So uh, she was uh, good at writing this essay and uh, motivation. Um, so, uh, yes, and, but uh, of course, uh, back in mid-90s, SSC Riga was definitely the best school to study. And I, I, I do remember being... Um, very proud uh, about a uh, letter in my mailbox. I actually do remember even visually how we, mm. with my mother, we were going down from the fifth floor where we lived and we opened the uh, uh, post box uh, and uh, took out the letter. It was very short, but it was inviting me and I was actually very proud. It's interesting that it seems to be a bit of a reverse of what the story you sometimes hear about, you know, the person who from an early age wants to go into the financial mm. sector and then eventually, maybe in an early midlife yeah, crisis, course. throws it all off and opens yeah. a brewery or something, yeah. or decides yeah. that they're going to become a painter instead. Yeah. It's interesting to hear it coming from the other side. I can still do that. So. <laughs> <laughs> but what was it about um, this inspirational lecturer, Peter Hogfeld, that kind of, you said it he was important that you were there in his class and that you enjoyed yeah. it and it made a difference, but what was it about the way he taught or about what he instilled in you that, kind of made this change in your mind? Well, first, of course, he was a bit different than other other Swedish professors. He was quite uh, charismatic and demanding, and I would 
say probably from a Swedish perspective, sometimes maybe even rude, but uh, his way of expressing his passion about finance and, and, and also sort of putting the demands on students. And it was a demanding course also from a mathematical perspective. And since I was coming from, uh, from first of gymnasium and I had a mathematics background, maybe that was one way of how I could excel among peers. So I was, of course, uh, proud to excel. I think it somehow went in hand. And there was actually also, I remember that there was a couple of, uh, a small group of Estonians who were studying a year above me. And those guys were also very uh, passionate about finance because they were somehow related to the guys who were establishing Hansa Bank, mm -hmm. etc. So it was a, a small community of people who were very passionate and I was dragged into this as well. And Hansa Bank eventually became yeah, part of Swedbank. Yeah, it was bought, uh, bought by Swedbank, yes, back in 2000. And something that does seem to uh, come through quite a lot when we speak to alumni of, of SSE is that they sort of stay in touch later in their careers. I mean, are you still surrounded by the people you were in class with now in the industry? Or? Yeah. I actually have friends around me who are from SSC, uh, some of my very good friends with whom we share some uh, sort of hobbies or passions. Uh, although we have these annual president's uh, dinners uh, parties and I was surprised to find out that there are actually not so many SSC graduates in, in Swedbank, mm -hmm. around 20 -ish or so, but I, I, initial my sort of instincts told me that it should be like, I don't know, 50 <laughs> plus 100, uh, no, but it's not, it's, it's actually 20-ish, um, uh, uh, primarily with, uh, with, uh, with uh, analytical and high intelligence uh, sort of uh, jobs. Uh, so it's not quite as incestuous as people might uh, yeah. imagine. Though. In a bank. But on the other hand, yeah. SSE Riga has in late years been very much entrepreneurial as well. So uh, I actually like this change. Yeah. Not everybody should work in a bank. So <laughs> I'm fine with people, people being uh, entrepreneurial. And actually, so we benefit from that. And uh, moving on then to sort of the, well, your core duties, as yeah. it were. Swedbank is the largest financial institution in the Baltic states. And yet, of course, as the name implies, it's uh, Swedish-owned. Yeah. So yeah. how exactly does it work that uh, a Swedish bank uh, operates on this side of the Baltic Sea? And, and, and sort of what role does it play in the economy? Well, um, of course, Swedbank plays a big role in Baltic economies. It is by uh, far the largest uh, bank, and of course it plays a big role, and both Swedish banks uh, do. Uh, and by now we are also quite uh, consolidated. We also are, of course, much more um, significant role in Baltics than uh, probably Swedbank plays in Sweden. Since in Sweden it's a bit more fragmented, there are more banks and also more uh, institutions who sort of are, 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 are playing all kind of different roles. In, 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 in Baltics, banks uh, historically have been uh, sort of very influential and large in size, and also the ones who have been bringing a lot of sort of Western practices into, into the business uh, environment. Um, I don't know, yeah. So, of course, it both plays in size and in culture and in how we are perceived. Uh, <laughs> I think also one thing I probably should mention in Baltics, we are one of the sort of uh, organizations who are also very much liked. Uh, we are big, we are a profit-making organization, we are working with our societies quite well, I think, with our different societal initiatives, uh, especially in the fields of education, and we are actually also the most loved brand. Try to find a place in the world where you would have a <laughs> big bank, very profitable and the most loved uh, brand. So I'm actually quite, uh, quite uh, proud and happy on how we are uh, working locally. And working locally, though, is it a case of we do everything here in Latvia the Swedish way, that you know, the rules all come from Stockholm, or is there a to and fro? Because I remember hearing mm. several years ago that uh, Swedbank... Uh, mm. Sweden chief executive, I think it was when Michael Wolf was in charge, was saying, you know, the Baltics to us are mm. part of our home mm. market. They're no different yeah. from the Swedish yeah. market. But I'm, I've never been entirely convinced by this. It yeah. seems that they are slightly different in character. I mean, is, is that yeah. fair? It is fair, of course, if you look at sort of um, Swedish, Swedbank and, and the Baltic, of course, it's... Um, a Swedish banking sector is, I don't know, 20, 30 times bigger than the, the, the Latvian or Baltic one. So it's a, so, so, size-wise, it's mm. it's not comparable. Even of course, uh, of course, it's 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 much bigger bank in, in Scandinavia. 
but on sort of on user experience, uh, banking overall, it's quite it's quite a simple uh, sort of business. Uh, if you look sort of from afar, you take deposits and you lend out credits so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, in a way a very simple business and it's not different in uh, there as and in here but i think these uh, things um, are very uh, sort of where the difference is coming your user experience because for the banks this last uh, period has been very much of making a lot of services and processes uh, sort of seamless so mm-hmm. that the customer wouldn't even notice if you look deeper we are we are we are uh, we are working to make our customers life uh, simple and not noticeable uh, we have been through a lot uh, huge uh, how to say uh, progress in doing our transformation and integration because uh, a few years ago we of course uh, understood that there is no need to have three different product developers three different process analysts so the first step was to actually make a one uh, Baltic bank so we went through this uh, integration uh, process and during last two years we have done quite a bit of integration also in the group so to become one bank so in a way from a user experience perspective i would say it's the same uh, bank uh, across four markets the size matters and there are some differences i don't know in sweden you are maybe a bit better in in in, in analytics you are maybe uh, working a bit better with data uh, because you know in the banking you these days you have to be very precise you because getting the product or service to the person at the wrong time is a bad uh, bad mm. advertisement so you need to catch the uh, life situations of an individual uh, very precisely to deliver your sale and i think that uh, our swedish organization has been very good at the analytics and the segmentation side so we are learning on robotics uh, we have been very good at transforming our business models uh, uh, for example um, like working with a mass segment so you know that efficiency has been one of the big things for banks we have to compete with these newcomers and of course we are very big infrastructure which costs a lot so 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 we have been um, working a lot with with our service models on how we treat our mass customers how, what is our service promise uh, with our consultation levels etc so the actually compared even also i think if you compare the baltic customers and swedish customers baltic customers are very demanding mm. baltic customers are not ready to wait 20 30 minutes uh, in consultation centers they get angry they scream in sweden easily you could easily find the average 20 30 minutes people would wait for a call and would uh, not be angry because so, it does seem to me that just in my local branch of swedbank for example you, you you can no longer go in there and just sort of straight away ask for a, a, an interview you have to kind of basically make an interview in advance yes. and there's a barrier a physical barrier to prevent you actually walking into mm. the in, into the branch it seems to me that maybe this is something which can slightly reduce the friendly image that maybe Swedbank had before because it looks like you're kind of keeping people at a slight arm's length. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I actually disagree. I think this uh, appointment booking is actually meant for you in order not for you to wait in a, in a, in a line so you can uh, plan your visit to the bank. You know that, okay, tomorrow at one o'clock you could walk down there and do your business in whatever, 15, 20 minutes. Otherwise, and you know when you're going to go there and what's going to be your time slot. If you're going to come in in a branch, you might end up waiting for 40 minutes, 30 minutes. Of so then it's a, it's a kind of a cultural change. You have to, the customer has to understand a different way of doing It's a things. different way of planning your time. Mm. But people might not believe it, but on average, every year, the, the branch visits decrease 20%. So people do come less and less in, in mm-hmm. the branch. You said that you're going to the branch. I, I was surprised to hear that. I, I actually, when I asked myself, when I was first time to the branch... Well, I think I am quite old. <laughs> <laughs> With, while I'm on my complaint mode then, because I should declare that I do actually have an account at Swedbank, but um, I understand that one problem you did have recently, obviously that we have new technology being introduced yeah. all the time, was the replacement of um, code cards yes. with an application. Yes. Now, I personally I had to buy a new phone in, it yeah. in order to be able yeah. to run this application yeah. so that I could then you know, authenticate my yeah. uh, purchases. And I think that a lot of yeah. older people, pensioners in particular, had a lot of trouble uh, finding out that basically they couldn't yeah. really do transactions yeah. anymore yeah. without help from younger <laughs> relatives often. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do, do you like your, your phone? Uh, it's all right. I'd rather not have bought one, but, you know, it works. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, I'm, if I was younger, I'd probably be relieved that I had a new phone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but 
was this something which was a bit of a blind spot? That was yeah. this something that you saw coming, or you were surprised by yeah. when it happened? Yeah. Still, even today, if you did not want to buy the new smartphone in order to install the smart ID, you could still easily have chosen the code calculator as an option. So it's not necessarily that you need to buy a new smartphone. Well, no, I would just have to get a calculator instead of a phone. Instead of uh, the code card. Yeah. So the code cards, it's, it's a regulation. Uh, we went this way that we tried to digitalize our, our society. I should say it was a big process for us for the last 12 months. I, 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 we, we migrated uh, uh, more than 600 people from code cards to, 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 to these different authentication tools. So the smart ID um, usage is now stands at, uh, I think from our customer, two thirds of people use smart ID. They're not complaining. Once you start using, you see how, how easy that is. Interestingly, is that if you look at sort of the segments who are most complaining, it's not sort of the older people. <laughs> it's, it's people like me. <laughs> 50, 55 are the people who are least uh, receptive. Okay, to I'm nearly shape. there. <laughs> exactly. And that is surprising. So there is some resistance from this age group. Uh, Maybe these are just the people who in general like to complain more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe once you're in pension, you have more time and you want to study something new and you want to have a new phone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well then give me a warning as to what, what's going to be the next technological innovation, do you think, that is kind of rolled out? Uh, that's probably a tough one. Okay, on a very simple, simple uh, answer would be that the next one, next uh, move will be to move to payments with a phone. So moving away a bit from the cards. For Android, it's, it's possible to pay with the phone right now. Mm -hmm. With Apple Pay, we are uh, very soon to be there. So I think, uh, and I think it will happen actually quite fast. It will not take, it, it will not be sort of uh, uh, push. Uh, I think people just naturally will migrate from paying paying, paying with the phone. This is probably, it's coming in, in, in a month or so. And probably in a year or in two, everybody will be just paying with their phones. So mm. that's a quick, quick uh, sort of uh, uh, quick answer on sort of daily habits uh, side. But, uh, but the, 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 the um, room is open as I should say, for this, because there are this PSD2 uh, now with open banking and our APIs. Anybody can come in and build their sort of idea if it requires sort of um, client's personal account or account data. You can build your service on this. And so I can see you just explain this a little bit more? You've kind of, kind of lost me there with yeah. those acronyms. Yeah. This PSD2 uh, regulation uh, requires that uh, if client gives a consent to a third, a third party to access to his, to his account, so the banks have to guarantee the access to the third party. The third party can be anything, basically. It can be a, a wallet. As some guys, I don't know, in, in, in Tallinn, for example, mm -hmm. could, uh, could hire two programmers and could make a very nice uh, new uh, sort of digital wallet in, in a phone. And with PSD2, easily, if client gives consent, they can feed the data, account data into this wallet, and they would never need to go to any of the bank's uh, apps. So that's, that's, that's one type of innovation, sort of different, uh, different wallets. But of course, you can build all kinds of services on this, uh, on this data. For example, I don't know, we, uh, everybody is purchasing all kinds of appliances, electronic appliances. Whenever you purchase an appliance, you get a receipt. It's being uh, put on your, uh, uh, receipt is put on some kind of uh, paper and it's sort of your warranty. Mm -hmm. Once you come home, you lose the warranty. Next day, you do not, know, do not know where it is. So in a case, somebody would offer you pay one euro a year to me and I will keep your warranties storaged in my small app and I can feed this data from your account because I know who sold and what sold and at what price and when I have all the data I will just store your warranties in this uh, particular place maybe you would be ready to pay this one euro a year for mm -hmm. example as a, as, a, as, a, as a security in order not to lose this paper paper warranty so you can build all you can basically what I'm saying you can build all kind of services by having this access to the account well, this, this is an interesting point because I, I've spoken to some people in kind of fintech startups and so yeah. on. And some of them will say things like, yeah. look, the big banks are dead. Everyone's going to be yeah. doing a completely different model of banking in the yeah. future. And others seem to be saying, well, it's kind of our role to come in and act almost as the research and development uh, units, yeah, which yeah. the big banks can then buy yeah. into. Yeah. They can either buy us out or they can, you know, use our licensed software or our apps or whatever, a bit like you've, yeah. been, you've been saying there. I mean, do, do you think that that's how things are going to roll out, that the big financial institutions are going to stay big yeah. or 
are these kind of young Turks going to come and just seize huge amounts of market share? Yeah. I think that this view that uh, small fintechs are competing with the banks, it, it's already a, an old one, because the small fintechs, they need to have a customer base. Banks probably need sort of uh, to uh, make more rich service offering, which can sort of be fed by these young fintechs, and, but the fintechs need access to the customer base. There is a lot of potential of good corporations these days, a lot of potential, and I think that this, uh, this will be something that will be coming more and more, uh, that the banks will be actually onboarding the, their partners into mm. their sort of uh, uh, yeah, ecosystem. So it's not going to be that you know, the... the Large-scale banks now just end up being divided into, let's just say, hundreds of niche banks. That, that no, of course there is a wave also in the banking to 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 uh, to, to uh, how to say break down the bank into the product unit, service unit channels, and, and put it like a Lego. And of course you can replug some of the components. But I think that the banks will still be playing a significant role going forward. And I think that the success actually comes from the how well the banks will be able to cooperate with the, with the fintechs. And this will be success also for fintechs to access the customer base. One thing I did want to just mention to you, uh, it would seem strange if we didn't, yeah. is you mentioned earlier on that Swedbank has this very positive reputation. It does come consistently high in terms of uh, employer ratings, yes. and in terms of customer satisfaction yeah. and so on. That's been established over quite a few years. But at the moment, it has a little bit of a reputational yeah. issue, um, not alone in that, uh, in that, particularly in Latvia and Estonia, the mm. Swedish, Scandinavian banks more widely, mm. uh, are under increased scrutiny at the moment as a result of questions mm -hmm. about their mm -hmm. money laundering record. Uh, for a long time, it seemed as if the Scandinavian banks were kind of the clean ones, and yeah. there were lots of little boutique banks, particularly in Latvia, which were doing you know, highly questionable yeah. uh, deals. And I think people looked to the Scandinavian banks for a bit of leadership and for sort of security, yeah. Yeah. Example, felt that yeah. we, they were the clean banks. Now that's kind of in question. Uh, yeah. what, is it the case that you were just doing the same things all along, or mm. is this a case of mm. increased scrutiny is kind of rooting out this slight infection which mm. had come from the rest of the, the market? Yeah. I still want to confirm that the banks are sort of uh, good and proper. In, in Latvia, we had uh, our sort of uh, outside audit back in 2016, and that resulted in, in a fine for us, and also with a certain findings that we have certain deficiencies in our internal control systems. Uh, the findings were not regarding money laundering, but in deficiencies in our control systems, which should supposedly catch these yeah. things. So that resulted in, in, in quite a bit of work for me when I stepped in. So I, was, I have been actually basically dealing from the, since day one with mm -hmm. this uh, with this uh, um, work. And I should say that we have done a tremendous progress, not only in Latvia, but the things, of course, went over also to Estonia and, and, and Lithuania. We have done a tremendous pro pro progress in, in strengthening our internal control systems. Uh, so I would say that at the moment I feel very confident in where we are and I can, I can assure you there are no risks of, of the sort you mentioned. Historically, though, there, are, there were these deficiencies. Uh, I do not have any um, sort of uh, knowledge myself uh, or information that there have been certain breaches, sanctions, etc. But, uh, but uh, probably um, uh, there have been some suspicious transactions and no bank probably could have avoided them in history. And once sort of you dig, you, you, you find them. So I think that, uh, I think that um, we have a history which... Now the current investigators have to come up and conclude how significant and how big we have it, but it's dealt with and it's, 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 it's a history. You said you came in kind of almost with a brief to, to, to clean this up yeah. and to sort this problem yeah. out. I'm just wondering what sort of lessons have you learned along the way in terms of you know, protecting your image, uh, mm. being seen to do the right thing? Is it a case of just being open, maybe more open than people had been in the past and, or explaining step by step what you're doing, more in general terms of not crisis management, but in terms of uh, you know, communicating effectively yeah. what you represent, what the, the values of the bank really are. Yeah, yeah. 
I can certainly probably uh, also think that uh, that uh, there has been some problems uh, in our sort of communication tactics. Uh, I think the group people decided uh, to go with in 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 in, in, you know, in autumn and, and also beginning of the year. They should have been more uh, transparent of our business model and also some of the risks maybe in the past. I think that actually has maybe built this uh, this uh, how to say. Uh, media interest into the Swedbank because of course we are and I can still confirm very much different business models than non-resident banks mm. uh, had here or also the business model Danske Bank had in Estonia. I, I'm, I'm quite certain about that. This is completely different business model. But the banks, they are not isolated. So there are payments coming and going between the banks. And of course, our primary risk for a Swedbank has been not our direct customer risk, since we do take care of our customers, but our customers' customer risk, which we should maybe have taken a bit more through, throughout the analysis. Yeah. And so, as we're kind of coming to the, the end of our time now, but uh, let's say in like 10 years' time, yeah. what is the relationship between uh, a bank like Swedbank and a customer or a business going to be? What's it going to look like? How's it mm-hmm. going to be different from what it is yeah. today? Yeah. I think that, uh, from my perspective, I think that IML wave will pass. I think it's already. I think that IML risk, as itself, is very, very minimal in in, in, in Baltics. There might be some still compliance and and some some aspects which need to be sort of uh, improved, etc. Some monitorings, etc. But but I think that with this wave, I think we already in 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 in, in the past we are small small countries and we are we are fast in in changing uh, systems and habits, etc. The big wave probably what is coming is going to be uh, sustainability mm-hmm. uh, aspects. Of course, now it's only a sort of sort of awareness level uh, uh, being discussed uh, but it will come I think the regulation will also come it will come similarly as we had I don't know with the credit side there was a credit crisis a lot of regulation came to the credit side we had to implement all kind of uh, models pricing models capital models they had to be improved now we have a, a, an IML wave now we're going to work through the sort of uh, internal control systems it's going to uh, pass next five years probably is going to come sustainability and that will come also with regulation with uh, we will probably will need to evolve our customer base on these aspects. We will need to keep uh, uh, sort of capital against uh, uh, higher risk uh, clients from sustainability perspective, etc. I think this is the next next uh, next topic on a, on a plate. One one final thing I wanted to to ask you as well is, you know, your position is obviously a very stressful one. I imagine at, at certain times particularly in the sense that people are always kind of hanging on your every word. You know, if you say the wrong thing, just a slip of the tongue, That's it can true. move a market, <laughs> it can result in yeah. you know, all sorts of That's large true. consequences. How do you cope with that? Because it, it seems you must have either a character which is uh, naturally able to cope with yeah. uh, this kind of stress or you have developed some sort of technique yeah. to do it. Yeah. I should say that it comes a bit with experience. I will not deny my first uh, six months of job were really hard. I was I was I was uh, going through a lot of sort of internal internal uh, stress. Uh, but uh, sort of uh, you you adjust uh, when your first interview comes. I remember actually my first TV interview was basically when the fine came. And, and basically, when the journalists came to the building, both national TVs, and the questions they asked was, um, okay, uh, why do you launder money? <laughs> I said, no, no, no. The fine was regarding the deficiencies in the internal control systems. It said, no, no, no. Why do you launder money? <laughs> and they actually asked this five, five times in a row the same question. And I, I was, not, I was, uh, I was, uh, I remember I was pretty stressed in, in getting through these uh, first uh, first uh, rounds of uh, attacks. Mm. Uh, but uh, I think it comes with a, a bit with experience, maybe. You, you can keep a bit more cooler head and not be so much or, uh, sort of personally uh, uh, involved. Uh, you, you do your job to your best. As a, as a, as a, as a, as I process it, I have my I don't know. I, I of course every person needs a way of how to process any kind of stress. My way of processing the stress is running and, and listening to the books. So. And I heard as well that you have studied theology and philosophy. Yes, that's true. Yes. Does that help, or is that a bit of a too convenient way of, uh, of of saying that you know you have this other outlet, this other part of your brain that's not banking? 
Yeah, people. Uh, some people think that now, yeah, of course, you can run to yours this different world and, and, and forget things. For me, it's the same world. It's not a different world. Neither this uh, philosophical aspect or theological aspect. It's about me, about my beliefs, about my way of thinking, about my values. It's the same world. Lainis, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening. This podcast was produced by SSC Riga. If you'd like to learn more about the topic, visit the open course schedule at SSC Riga Executive Education. For more podcasts, find us on Spotify, iTunes, or the platform of your choice. Remember, share this episode with your friends and colleagues.